So, what were you saying? Yes. Totally. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, Anapanasati has been very interesting. Um, I haven't ever really been much of like a breath meditation guy because I just never uh, got into it. Um, and it's been very, very powerful. Um, I've, my, uh, I, I really enjoy the, the new way of thinking about sati, not as, um, not as necessarily like mindfulness, but as, as remembering, shifting um, back. Um, and it's, it's been, it's been very interesting, um, there's like, it almost feels like there's this natural kind of, uh, and wisdom that I sometimes feel when I come back from noticing that my mind has wandered back, back to the breath. It's almost like, oh, nice. I don't have to, <laughs> I don't actually have to continue with that, you know? Um, Excellent. That's the way to cultivate it precisely. Yeah. Um, it's like, and, oh, I don't have to think about that stuff. <laughs> completely. And yeah, In, it's, yeah. Go it's ahead. like it's a, it's like it's a um, like a great unifier of all of the distractions that you could possibly have. It's like, nope, just come back to the breath. You know, it's that that's always a better idea. <laughs> than, right. That in fact, uh, the here now, very, very rarely has actual clear immediate danger or actual clear immediate things to be done. Exactly. Normally, the here now is quite a nice, pleasant place. And yet people spend their time in the here now thinking about all of the dangers and all of the problems. That, yeah, <laughs> it's been a very uh, powerful thing to realize is just that like when when I'm not super kind of caught up in mind talk and all that stuff that like normal moments are like quite pleasant. <laughs> you know? I actually have a real life story about that that just happened just to prove this point. This happened, it started two days ago that the, uh, during the day when Tam wasn't here, the truck wouldn't start. We wanted to move the truck because the coconut man with the coconut monkeys were here and they didn't want to have coconuts landing on the truck, but it wouldn't start. All right. So later the thoughts come, oh, we've got a problem. We've got to go get the truck started. What can I do about that? Maybe we need a charger. Maybe we need a new battery. Chargers are cheaper than batteries. And if I get a battery and then, you know, blah, and then I say, no, wait a minute, out. Not my problem. Yeah. And it's just, I just forgot about it, you know, uh, within five minutes after the truck, the actual yeah. incident, and then it was over for me. The next morning, I look out, and there is Tam in the yard with a brand uh, with a new, a, a different truck, an old different truck we've never seen before, with a tie driver that I recognize. And who is it? Mm -hmm. But it's one of the guys that does the monkey business. Uh -huh. bringing out the coconuts. Yeah. And so there he is, and he gets it started and, and uh, spends some time with it, and Tam eventually gives him some money, and off he goes. He winds up uh, being a neighborhood shade tree mechanic. But it turns out the whole point was is there really no, was nothing for me to do. Right. So the car won't start. Forget about it, you know. <laughs> It'll take care of itself. Exactly. And oftentimes, many of the things that we don't, that we do want to have happen, a lot of other people want those very same things to happen. So just let them work on it. In fact, in many cases, one more hand is not going to help. <laughs> They're wrong when they say every vote counts. Oh, no, it doesn't. The Republicans guarantee that's not going to happen. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so the best thing to do is just to forget about politics. There's enough people worried about it already. They don't need somebody else to worry about politics. Right. And in this case, there was already enough people worried about getting that truck started. I didn't have to do that. <laughs> right. No, that's that's something I notice all the time is just like, um, and, and especially also when I'm off the cushion, um, it's just like, finding that I'm in one of those loops and one of those whole, what am I going to do? What, are, what, what do I need to do? Blah, 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 blah. Um, and then I just like, come back to the breath. And then I notice like some minutes later, I'm like, that was completely unnecessary. <laughs> like I did not need to spend any time thinking about that stuff and getting all riled up and getting all worried. It, li it didn't serve any purpose. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the things that happens with people that I, and this is something that over time I recognized for myself and began to see what it was and then almost immediately it was worth giving up. And it comes under the classification that I would call it is, is that we do not trust that we can handle a particular point in time in the future very well. And so therefore we need to rehearse it. Yeah. An example of that is, is that I've got to think about that email a whole bunch. And if I think about it while I'm writing it, then I can do good enough spontaneous emails and then do some edit and let them go. I do not have to plan in advance. Yeah. Because when I'm in advance, I say, well, the computer's not here and I trust myself when I get to the computer that I can write the email. I don't have to rehearse right now. <laughs> as, as if you're going to get to the computer and just forget everything, you know, what forget how to type and forget how to <laughs> well no i mean the rehearsal in the sense of thinking about what i want to put in the email yeah 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 the rehearsal is the, the spinning in of the mind of um uh, reciting or rehearsing or uh, mind spin right. some people go for a really mild word like thinking about <laughs> That just sounds kind of ridiculous, almost. Like, <laughs> so innocuous. Like, yeah, that's the whole point is, is that until this is pointed out, we just all do it automatically. We don't trust ourselves. When we get to the point that we really trust that we can handle any present moment, all we have to do is be here now, and we can do it. Right. That's almost, in fact, part of the path of the soda pond is to have that self-confidence that is uh, actually referred to in the suttas um, and spoken about among some monks about the lion's roar. Yeah. That you, if you're going to be a Buddha, if you're going to follow the path of the Buddha, part of the path of the Buddha is to become a lion to be top quality first class merchandise that roars at all the junk. Yeah. <laughs> Whether people like to hear the roar or not. Exactly. And so in that case, the, uh, the roar comes in with just as a spontaneous. So the, the email is written and many times the people that I send it to it, you know, is to help them to, to tone it down because they're almost always is the response is, this is a roar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so that's where the, this is what we're talking about in the sense of self-confidence. Yeah. Is, and, and in that regard, it's not even confident, it's not even the self that you're confident in. Yeah. What the confidence is in is in a set of skills that leads to one's right view, one's right sati, one's right action, uh, or in in the sense of right effort, rather, yeah. leading to one's right um, attitude. So that then one's right action comes from that noble state. 
that this is one, in fact, of one of the places where you can see the clear division between the super mundane, the noble Dhamma, the Dhamma that the Buddha teaches, as opposed to a, a classical, ordinary Dhamma, or uh, what I call the Buddhist religion, that has spread so widely so that uh, Thailand, for instance, claims about 95% of all of the Thai people are Buddhist, leaving about 4% for uh, Muslims and about 1% for anything else. Okay. Yeah. But within that Buddhist uh, uh, classification, you'll find a wide variety of beliefs. One of the belief systems that you'll find widely in Thailand is so close to um, Hinduism that there is almost no mistaking it. Mm -hmm. They even use the same language. Mm -hmm. And then there is others who say, oh, no, we have to change our language, but they still believe all of the same things. And then there are people who, uh, um, let us say, this is very interesting because this next group that I want to talk about is actually part of my Thai family and my Thai wife fits into that. And that is, is that what much of the culture of Thailand gets is the very, very best qualities of Buddhism that is raised right into the culture. Mm. And because of that, they do go to the temples and do some of the pujas and some of the things like that. But they also recognize that that's just part of the culture, it's part of the puja, that when uh, Tam takes Kitty to the temple to do the puja, uh, Kitty knows that this is just part of being Thai rather than we're actually expecting any magical things to happen by doing the puja. Right, yeah. And so what we're talking about is a vast amount of Thai people are pooled of Thai people that really enjoy and love Buddhism, but they don't pay much attention to the temples and they do not pay any attention to the magic so that the average Thai person on the street, if you ask him, does he believe in God, he will laugh before he stumbles into an answer that he doesn't have. <laughs> yeah. Because it's just not part of the culture or anything. And then, there is a smaller group that uh, up until, let us say, less than 100 years ago was distinctly within the, 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 um, the Sangha. And that was the actual real super mundane Dhamma that released people from their suffering. And the Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa then got into a great big deal of trouble in some quarters because of that. But in for another great big group of people, it was a big ho-hum, who cares? But there was also enough nobles within that group of the monks that were making judgments about it that the whole community came to understand that Bhikkhu Buddha Das is teaching the really good stuff. Right. He's right. Yeah. And this is the best high-quality stuff that Buddhism has to offer. The problem is he's teaching the wrong people. Right. Yeah. Okay. Just like Jesus says, don't spread your your um, <laughs> your pearls among the swine. Exactly. The answer yeah. is why not? <laughs> swine like pearls too. They think they're very crunchy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so this is what's happened: is is that this deep Buddhism that is being opened up to the West now through, oh, there's quite a lot of us. I can name you quite a few that's involved with this. Robert Bucknell and, and Bhikkhu Dhammavitu and Santikaro and uh, uh, Christopher Titnus. Um, there's just a whole group that are, that are working on, uh, uh, Robert I also, uh, are working on translations or teachings and doing all kinds of things with with Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, but what I find is there's a lot of, of um, resistance to the actual deeper Dhamma within the newly found Western Buddhist community, that what came of Buddhism was that sector of Buddhism who was really attached to a very Hindu way of looking at 
Buddhism. Interesting. And so uh, most of the Buddhists that you'll find anywhere, especially the five or 600,000 people that are signed up for Reddit, yeah. almost all of them are Hindus and they don't even know it. Mm -hmm. And this is how that happened, you see, is because Buddhism is supposed to be teaching rebirth. Yeah. All right. But what's the difference between rebirth that the Buddhists teach and reincarnation that the Hindus teach, um, let us say, commonly now throughout history and all the way back to the time of the Buddha, they taught a kind of reincarnation that we now use that word reincarnation to describe. So what's the difference between Hindu reincarnation and Buddhist rebirth? Do you even know the difference? I mean, not not to a significant degree. <laughs> well, guess what? There has been, and, and this was part of what was happening in, in uh, Thailand during that those court trial dates where there were literally hundreds and hundreds of Buddhist monks scouring the Pali and the Thai versions and everything looking for any evidence of an actual rebirth. Mm or any place where the Buddha made a distinction between the reincarnation that the Hindus had when he was there and an actual teaching of rebirth. So in that regard, the, the at least whatever word got to be used for rebirth is not found as an actual teaching of the Buddha. Furthermore, the Buddha says, I teach only one thing. I teach suffering and the end of suffering. Right. And that was in response to having been accused of teaching what is now normally referred to as annihilationism, right. but is much more commonly known as atheism. Now, wow. what we mean by annihilationism is, is upon the breakup of the body, the being is annihilated. But the Buddha doesn't teach that, that there's a being to be annihilated. He's selling that there is no being to be annihilated. Right. But he was never occur, uh, accused of being an eternalist. What is that? The eternalist is that that being is not annihilated upon the breakup of the body. It somehow goes on just so that it can get kicked in the ass by the common machine. That's the whole purpose of keeping it around. Right. Um. That's really strange, you know, why a common machine would really want to keep punishing people for the bad deeds they do. Right. Yeah. So anyway, back to the point here is, is that what happens when people have really strange beliefs about deep, dark past and far off futures is that that actually adds an additional burden to the fact of being here now because we don't need to think about the truck that didn't start yesterday. <laughs> we don't, what's yesterday, you know? Yesterday is just as far in the past as 300 years ago is. Yeah, yeah. And in that regard, we don't, we don't need any uh, issues about the past. But here's where that, that point comes in, is, is that many people in Buddhism have taken that noble right action and noble right speech that one, um, let us say, really is intentionally cultivating when he's reached, let us call it, that he's enjoying the fruit of soda pot. That's the best way I can describe it. When one is enjoying the fruit of soda pot, he doesn't want to break any of that stuff up the joy that he has of being in that state of, of uh, uh, this is great. <laughs> and so he, he winds up then having noble behavior because he doesn't want anything. Right. If I don't even care about the truck getting started, how am I going to drive that truck down to the bank and rob it? Now, how? <laughs> you know, <it's> like... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But they have taken this, these, uh, these qualities of the noble mind and taking them and made them into a list of rules. And then they pass these rules out to the children and say, oh, you've got to behave this way or the big common machine that, uh, that lives someplace in India is gonna kick your butt. Right. 
it's just the same like you know do do good and you'll get a goodie and do bad and you'll get punished exactly but in fact the buddha had four different versions of karma and he did not disagree like some of the ones who there were those that were either teaching a no self exist or the annihilation of a being but in either case they were saying that there was no comma there was no results of my actions i could in one regard or in one case go across the river and kill every animal over there and then come back on this side of the river and kill every animal over there over here and i will suffer no results well the answer is that may not be true you may in fact not enjoy stepping over a bunch of dead cows <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you may in fact not even like doing it yeah <laughs> too much might... work just to make a point yeah but the buddha says oh no we are responsible for our actions but that responsibility is fairly short-lived mm. and one of the ways of looking at the short-livedness of it has very much to do with modern physics and here's, an, here's a clear example of that. You do know that in uh, Newton's law of, of uh, gravity, that things are divided by the square of the distance. So the further two objects are apart, the less gravitational pull they have on each other, right? right. And we also know that no matter what speed we go at, the further two things are apart, the longer it takes from, to go from one destination to the other. So therefore, uh effectiveness of comma is going to rot away at this at the square of the time that it exists mm. uh -huh. i don't think anybody's actually figured out a law that has that in it uh -huh. but you can see it right there with the e equals mc square it's the same reason that the e equals mc square the reason that square is the same reason that uh, the dx is the uh, the distance is squared in uh, Newton's laws. Yeah. All right. So that's one of the ways of looking at it. But the, that's the whole point is, is that the Buddha says there are four imponderables. I don't want to get off into a great lesson about it, except that one of them is, is that you do not know the results of future karma. You don't mm -hmm. know what the results are going to be. Right. But you can judge what the immediate results of things are going to be. If you sure. stab your hand with a knife, it's going to bleed. That's just how things are. And not only that, but you will not like the sensations. And yeah. unless you're proving a point like allegiance to a king or something, and this is going to get you something really valuable, and right. then you're willing to do it. <laughs> I'm well to you. Give me money, money, money. <laughs> you know, or something in that regard. Yeah. But here's the point here's, even if he likes it that's immediate results he yeah. feels really good that he was capable of stabbing his hand in to, uh, to prove his allegiance so he got joy right then right all right so that's the way that comma works is is that and the buddha talks about that in the lion's roar sutta is is that he knows that the results of comma is dependent mm -hmm. And he goes back to that whole point about dependent origination. Uh, uh, with this, there is that. Without this, there is not that. There was no actual formal scientific law that they knew of in the time of the Buddha, but we certainly know it now. Right. And it's called the law of causality. Yeah. Or the law of cause and effect. You do this, you get that. You stop doing that, you won't have that anymore. That's just how things yeah. are. All right, and in fact, that's what a Nietzsche or that changing quality is all about. For instance, it's very hard for a small bug on the floor to be seen until that bug starts to crawl. When it moves, now it's changed. And because it's changed, the eye can pick it up and see it. Right. But things can hide in plain sight by just not moving. Yeah. Look like that it blends into the background and everything is cool. But if it tries to run away, you'll chase it. Yeah. All right. So this is the whole quality of about a Nietzsche is, is that it has to do with cause and effect. It has to do with immediacy. And that's the kind of karma that the Buddha teaches in the sense of there is good karma that gives good results and there is bad karma that gives bad results. 
But the longer that comma go, do good, it may take, um, let us say, the longer it takes to get the benefit of the good, uh, good results from it, the longer it takes, the less likely it will happen. Mm -hmm. But now that's only two laws. And the Buddha says, oh, no, there's a third law. And in fact, this third law really destroys the first two anyway, mm -hmm. at least the long term ones that people think of that has some sort of magical comma machine. All right. And that is, is that there is an, an action that is both um, bright and dark and gives both bright and dark results. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means is, is that there is action that is mixed results because it's got mixed um, motives and the motivations have to do with opinions anyway. Here's a very clear example of it. The flag goes down on the play of the football field. Half the people jump up in the air and yelling like this, this is a wrong thing to do and boo and all of that. The other half of the crowd jumps up and they say, yay! Generally, they're on one side of the station or, or the other. They're not going to be very mixed, so they may start <laughs> taking it out on each other, right? Duking it out. But that's the point right there. That proves that that action of throwing that penalty flag was a mixed action that had mixed results. Yeah. Because when those uh, reps or whoever throw those flags, they know that by throwing that flag, they're going to cause an uproar. Yeah. So this is the way that it works. And the, here's the interesting thing. All right. Let's go to a really bizarre result. Hitler and the situation with Auschwitz. Some people will say caused the nation of Israel. Uh-huh. Sure. Ah, silver lining. I mean, all right. Was it worth six million? No, it was not. <laughs> it was not worth it. But you can't say that there was not some sort of mixture in there. It wasn't one hundred percent bad action. I, I, it's funny because I was actually just thinking about that with that exact same example about how you can't you can't have Nazi Germany without the nation of Israel. It's interesting. Not, and it I, think it's the, I think it's the other way around. Oh, right. You could not have Israel, the nation of Israel, without Nazi Germany. Yeah, yeah. 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 Look, at, look at your calendar for. <laughs> <laughs> that, that actually, that whole issue of the cause and effect that you're just mentioning is a place where many, many people make mistakes all throughout their lives, all throughout normal society, but deeply within Buddhism too, that there's a lot of uh, things that happen that we either see the result first and then the cause, or we kind of see them at the same time, but because we saw the, cause, the result first and then the cause, we get them backwards. Yeah. And we think that the result created the cause, and that is so common. Sure. And you just made that, and so I thought I'd point it out mm -hmm. so that you can see how that works on a very subtle level sometimes. That, in fact, that's exactly why Patitya Samupada is such a profound teaching about how the mind works because it shows a step-by-step, -step, almost algorithmic sequence of events between the noting or seeing an object and falling right into suffering. Yeah. And all of the processes that go there and the various places that we can make arrangements or changes so that we can um, interrupt that stuff. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing that's very interesting also is, is that Anapanasati that you have started to practice when it's practiced well and correctly, it actually um, puts the student in a place to see Paticca Samuppada. In other words, Anapanasati practice is also related to and the, the seeing of Paticca Samuppada as it's in process. Mm -hmm. And I'll teach you about that when we talk about Vedana, which we've already started to talk about. 
but being able to see that stuff that's bubbling up in the mind in the form of old thoughts or old feelings is exactly what we're beginning to look at. Right. Yeah. Memory things. And here's the reason for that. Almost all of the bad feelings that you're capable of having right now, regardless of the news or the, uh, the situation or the bomb that went off or the granny who died in front of you or anything like that, all of the feelings that you possibly could have right now, you've already had those feelings before. Yeah. Quite possibly right often. Mm -hmm. And so you're already pre-programmed to feel really bad. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and all it takes is just a tiny little trigger to shoot off a really big cannon sometimes. Yeah. But what we don't have is we don't have that kind of, let us call it, just jokingly and stay right along with it, a weapon mm -hmm. so that we can pull a tiny little trigger and a big cannon of joy goes off. Right. A big cannon of, wow, this is so wonderful. Yeah, that never happens. <laughs> no, yes, it does. It, it's a skill to be developed. Right. Right effort, exactly. Yeah. That's all it. right, and all we have to do is train. We start off with a Derringer, and then we get a pistol, and then, uh, you know, a snub nose, and then we get a big um, uh, <clears throat> army... Um, uh, automatic, you know, and then you go to the what is it that uh, <laughs> Dirty Harry carried around a, a magnum, and then you go to some big weapon, and finally you wind up with your own nuclear bomb, and all you have to do is push it and go. <sighs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and in that regards, it's just a skill to be developed. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we're doing with that. And here's the reason or rationale behind this. And that is, is that we, everyone, human beings are out looking for pleasure. If we were not out looking for pleasure, most of the businesses would just dry, uh, dry right up, including all of the brothels. The police stations would close down. I mean, literally everything that we have our society is literally trying to rope in all of the desires, while at the same time, the uh, entire society is there, is promoting those desires. Go, go, go. Buy this. Take yeah. our ritual. Give us money. You know, work hard, work hard, work hard. Get ahead. <laughs> I've already got one. In fact, I've got another one, and I don't want to use it either. <laughs> So that whole society has gotten us into wanting to do something. And the, the promise is, is that you're going to get some benefit out of it. What is the benefit we have is the good feelings about satisfaction, the good feelings of joy, the good feelings of a job well done. Yeah. Well, guess what? You're capable of manufacturing those same feelings without investments in the world. Yeah. For some reason or another, way back when in the 1960s, anything that had association to do with the word meditation always had the connotation of bliss associated with it. That was before the word Vipassana was ever on the scene. Yeah. But the question was, where does all this magical bliss come from? Must come from that comma machine. It's got a ticker in it. And if you put in enough hours on the cushion, it's going to pop some cork and give you some <laughs> uh, bottle of juice or something, champagne from the Dama machine. All right? This is the way people think because that's magical thinking. Yeah. Yeah. That the bliss has to wait. You got to put in all the hard part first. Right. But that's not what the Buddha teaches. He teaches good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, and let's leave off all of that dash of pepper we call magic. <laughs> yeah. That's been a big um, problem I've had with, like, the uh, the pragmatic Dharma community. Um, mm -hmm. is there just doesn't seem to be so much effort on making the path one worth 
traveling all the way through throughout all of its steps. It seems very like let's let's get there. Come on. You know, like and, and really just sit down and just put thousands and thousands of hours in the it's very like my Mount Everest. Well, one of the ways of accumulating all those little steps is by reading every Dharma book for the past 2,500 years, pull that book steps out, pull another book steps out, pack them all together in a great big book, and we'll call it illumination or something. <laughs> yeah. But at least it's complete. Yeah. But not knocking that one or any other in particular, but learning how to have a joyful life is really hard to learn out of a book. Yeah. Mathematics <laughs> is really hard to learn out of a book, especially if you don't do the examples at the end of each chapter. <laughs> but musical instruments are also extraordinarily difficult right. to learn to play without a teacher. Yes. You can't learn it without a, with, from a book alone. Now, there's a whole lot of music books that have a whole lot of music in them, but somebody had to write those books. Yeah. And that uh, a teacher needs to, to teach the child about metronomes and scales and chords and fingering and all kinds of stuff that just did not in that book. Right. That if you haven't, for instance, played the guitar before, it's hard to pick up the ukulele from the Internet. Uh -huh. Yeah. Even though you watch the videos, yep. but having that teacher right in front of you, that's what does the trick. And that that's true throughout music all the way up that in fact is, is quite well known that as a, let us say a budding prodigy is improving in his skills, he changes teachers often mm -hmm. so that he can get the very best of what that very best teacher does. Uh, and then he'll get that down and then he'll go to another teacher. And that's done not only in the um, in the musical field, quite well known to be, but it happens kind of less formally in the uh, in the Sangha world where students go to one teacher and then the next and get various things from this one and that one. And so any good Dhamma teacher will know that he, he wants to see his students come and go. <laughs> Don't hang around and suck on my finger. There's too many people wanting to suck on it. I've only got five, you know. <laughs> so that's an important quality is, is that the, um, a good Dhamma teacher wants to see good results. Yeah. And so there's no holding back. Yeah. And so uh, the very best of the Dhamma, this noble Dhamma, will find a foothold in the West. There are enough people that, that will get it. And that I feel very pleased that, uh, that Achan Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa has put me on to doing these, uh, these videos. Yeah. And they're uh, of enormous value, I think, because the readership is going up. Yeah. yeah. They really are, and, yeah. And, and I like that because otherwise all of those folks that are looking at those videos and getting something out of them are not calling me on Skype. Otherwise, I'd be on Skype all the time. <laughs> but still, it's worthwhile. So let's um, take a moment and put some of this stuff together. The points that we've tied up around is, is that magical beliefs of any variety is basically the belief that I can put things off magically yeah. and they'll come back mm. like a boomerang. That's interesting. All right, that's what magic really is all about, that we can put things off, that I don't have to do the right effort that I need to put in right now. I can just do some puja and do it next time. Right. That's a very common attitude in Asia, and I imagine that it's already picked up in, in the West. Mm -hmm. That all I need to do is be a good enough Buddhist by Def following a set of rules. Yeah. Pardon? Definitely. Yeah, that's, that's definitely uh, manifested itself. 
you know, yeah. Well, but they're missing out on the fact that they could be completely happy. <laughs> they can, you know, all they have to do is change their attitude about how you know you got to come, you got to come do the the work. Yeah. And the and the work is supposedly easy to do. Yeah. That this is not heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's um, it has to do with identification. Yeah. If you could see something as suffering, as dukkha, then you're much more likely to let it go than if you think that it is, in fact, sukha. Yeah, definitely. So, definitely recognizing what is suffering and what is not suffering is a major aspect of the Buddha's path. That's why it's there. And in, yeah. and in that way, as meditators, you should actually start looking for states that are free from suffering. Is this good enough yet? Am I satisfied yet? Or do I still want something? Am I creating suffering right now for myself? No, no, I'm, I'm quite happy right now. Thank you very much. Yeah. But people don't allow themselves to have that kind of experience then and then build on it often so that we spend a lot of time in satisfaction. Yeah. We still want things out into the future. Mm -hmm. So if we can begin to develop these feelings so that we can give ourselves the very best of feelings, then we no longer want so much from the physical world. Right. So this leads into that point about the fourth kind of karma to tie that back. The fourth kind of karma is a kind of karma that is neither bright nor dark. And it leads to results that are neither bright nor dark, but it does lead to the end of karma. Uh. Action that leads to the end of action. Right. All right. Now, how does that happen naturally? It happens naturally because if we are on guard for dukkha, then we are naturally not going to be doing actions that will create dukkha. We're going to look in advance, plan things in a way to say, if I do that, something, if, if I hit my thumb with a hammer, there's going to be unfortunate results. Let's not do that. <laughs> so we begin to see what's, what's going on. We begin to understand, for instance, that anger. Anger hurts the guy who's angry. It doesn't hurt the other guy until you can get him to be angry, too. <laughs> right. That's the whole intention to make him angry. Yeah. yeah. And so um, when we recognize that anger, in fact, has no value, and it took a while, I thought that there was power in it, that I could get my way. Sure. I did sometimes. I've actually, actually gotten angry in front of people doing visas just to get a visa quicker. Hmm. Yeah. But it didn't work so well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got the visa, but the next time I came back to the office, nobody wanted to look at me. <laughs> Luckily, that was a long, long time ago. Uh -huh. So um, this is the thing. If we can recognize that our suffering creates dukkha, if we see our anger and know it, then we will automatically want to refrain from it or any of the other kinds of behaviors that would be negative action. So our actions now are free from negative results and it doesn't have that component. But if we can also get to the point of we don't really want anything, and the first example would be, a, oh, well, I really don't have to build a temple in the middle of this town to, to, uh, to be a high quality human that everybody looks up to. Mm. I can do that with a smile and I don't have to build that huge building. All right. So that's an example right there of um, not having to do good action so that we can get some benefit later from it. Mm. But normally those guys don't even do the big temple in the front of the village for the fact that now they're very special and highly respected in the community. He built that thing so that he can get a better life because this one is still trash. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Isn't that interesting that this is the, the state of mind that people have and that that state of mind is there across every religion. 
Mm-hmm. It's across the Buddhist religion, it's across the Hindu religion, it's across the Christian religion and Muslim religion, and just about the only one that's kind of coming out of that is the Jewish religion, because it's not a religion anymore. It's just dietary restrictions that they refuse to follow. <laughs> <laughs> And so congratulations for that. Because everyone else is going around doing magical tricks, trying to do good in order to get good results, just like the meditator does when he goes in there and sits down for 100 hours, keeping track of them, thinking that that comma machine is going to you know, bring him that bottle of uh, happiness someday. Yeah. Instead of recognizing, oh, no, it's got to be done now. You cannot wait. Every minute. Is, yeah. And this is why the Buddha talks about it. And I, I don't know exactly where it is, but it's just a really well-known story. And that is practice like your hair is on fire. I, I As was, you can see, uh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> took that very literally. <laughs> yeah. 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 That. yeah. For like somebody who's like head is being forced underwater or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Ah, yes, that's another one. When we recognize how much suffering we put ourselves through, we really want to start being on guard for it so that we don't let that stuff in. Yeah. And the best way to do that is by being in a really nice state of satisfaction. Yeah. So that's the first part of Anapanasati, especially within the context of that Vedana, where we have pity and Sukha. The pity is the uh, the win. Oh, I've got it. And then yeah. the Sukha is all oh, is it is nice. And yeah. when we're practicing that, it does put us into the first jhana, and that first jhana is also a very clear sign of the third noble truth. And that is freedom from suffering. Mm -hmm. And once we begin to practice in that state, we think it's so nice that we don't want to leave it. Yeah. And so we be start being on guard for the kinds of things that'll pull us out of it. Mm -hmm. So back to the issue of the comma. This is the, 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 the fourth kind of comma that we stop doing things just to get good results that we get our good results right now. That right. if I can give myself good feelings in, in my own mind, within my spiritual body, let's say, then why should I have to go take the physical body down to the store to get the pleasure? Right. In the physical world. Don't need to do it in the physical world, but that's what everybody's looking for. We're looking for satisfaction, we're looking for pleasure, and we're thinking we're going to find it at the market. Yeah. rather than within. Yeah. And so by practicing it within, that brings us to that kind of comma that leads us to the end of comma because we're already satisfied and there's nothing to do. <laughs> nothing to do and no place to go and I'm satisfied with the way things are. Thank you very much, I like this. Yeah. But a lot of people say, yeah, I know that you're in that state and it's really nice and all of that, but I want to be enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> totally. yeah. I need to do a thing to get a thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's possibly the very best definition of enlightenment that I can think of is just a simple word, satisfaction. Mm. When you become completely satisfied with things, then what left is there to do? Yeah. If enlightenment is above satisfaction, then you ain't satisfied yet. So you at least got to put satisfaction up there with the level of enlightenment. <laughs> so that's the trick. Can you get into that state of satisfaction? Step six of Anapanasati. And from there, we can be on the perch so that we can make sure that the thoughts and the feelings that we have will be the kind of thoughts and feelings that don't take us out of this state of satisfaction. 
And so we start being on guard to thinking about emails that have to be written mm -hmm. or <laughs> trucks that won't start or <laughs> all of the kinds of things that put our minds into turmoil when we don't need to think about those things until it's time to do it. Right. And, and if you wait long enough, it might not be needing to be done anymore. <laughs> I just take care of itself, yeah. Things will often time take care of themselves. It's true, yeah. So this is a way of looking at the world, of just taking the breather, literally. <laughs> yeah. Every time you can think of it, take a breather. Get out of the get out of the mind in the mind that wants things and get into the mind that's satisfied. Yeah. And even though this is so clearly pointed out in the suttas, it's hard to understand why Western Buddhism hasn't figured this out yet. It's not a hard practice. What's hard is to figuring out what is the actual correct practice. Once we figure out the actual correct practice, then we can do that actual correct practice fairly easily and get good results fairly quickly. Right. And I've got yeah. a lot of students that are fairly, or that are actually will tell you they're satisfied. <laughs> I feel like there's um, there's a kind of um, shame in feeling good in the West. Uh, a little bit like there's a there's a bit of a shame in feeling happy and contented like like something's going wrong if you're feeling like everything's okay oh well you can see the church doesn't want you to feel happy yeah they don't want you to feel happy if you feel happy you don't need them yeah then they're out of business yeah. And then they're out of business if everybody's happy. <laughs> they're almost all about, they're going out of business now, it seems like, for the first time in hundreds of years. Yeah. But then they're just being replaced by another thing that's saying, hey, get my stuff and then you'll feel great. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what happens. I see, in fact, one of the, not saying that this is true for everyone because people will disagree. But a quite a number of people who come into Western Buddhism come out of some other magical belief. That's just true. In fact, many people who are classified as nons actually are interested in Buddhism and they'll wind up, if they're not careful, getting sucked right back into the magic that they left before. Mm. Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa was actually, has actually said that it's not a good idea for a person to change religions, but rather what he would invite people to do is to go to the very depths of the religion that you've got and find out what's the very best part about it and live that. Yeah. But um, people don't do that because they don't find the very best in their religion. They think, oh, well, the grass is greener across that fence there, <laughs> that fence between the US and Asia. <laughs> it's called the Pacific. <laughs> but the grass is definitely better over there. There's more enlightenment over there than it is over here. So I'm going over there and see if I can find it. Yeah. So that's what Big Buddha does. It says, we don't really have to do that. But if you are already in Buddhism, then at least grab Buddhism by the right way. Yes. Grab like you would grab a snake. This is the simile of the snake. If you grab a snake by the wrong end, it'll bite you. Yes. You have to bite it. You have to grab that snake immediately right up by the throat. Yeah. Well, that's how you have to <laughs> grab the teaching of the Buddha. You have to grab it by the throat. If you grab it by the tail or anywhere else on it, it's going to turn around and bite you. Yeah. And what is it going to bite you with? The venom of magic. Magic is the venom that poisons the mind so that Buddhism doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so if we um, are coming out of saying one magical system like Christianity and come into Buddhism, it's very likely that people are going to pick up a magical form of Buddhism 
right off the bat because that seems to be what's most available. Mm -hmm. And then they get really stuck in it, just like they were stuck in the Christianity at one time. Right. Almost to the point of even though they cannot either understand the difference between rebirth and reincarnation or they cannot find it anywhere in the sutras because it's not then they get to the point of okay we insist that rebirth is a teaching of buddhism and anything against the teaching of uh, rebirth is not buddhism therefore it is not buddhism it is an alien thing and therefore you are banned from our reddit website <laughs> <laughs> So this is the way that it goes, and this is what's happened to it. But the joy is, is that there are so many people who are open to the actual super mundane Dhamma, mm -hmm. that they are willing to give this practice a go, recognizing all oh, that this Anapanasati is actually to help the mind come out of its selfishness, to come out of its planning for the future by building, for instance, bu building a big churches in the center of town. Yeah. We can come out of that whole belief system. In fact, this is one of the things that's really beautiful about what Suan Mok is, is that the buildings that are there are for a particular purpose. Like the spiritual theater has a lot of art and the library is useful for um, what it has, and the Zen Garden is actually a water storage facility, but people don't know it because it's mostly underground, and then the Zen Garden is on top. Oh, but, really? but, the, but the Bot, the actual temple, the thing that makes a Thai Buddhist temple look like a Thai Buddhist temple, in that place, there is no building. That there, the uh, is is the sacred boundary is marked the same way that it was in the time of the Buddha, and that is is that there are six sema stones that mark the boundaries of where that uh, where the holy ground is, and that if you go to any Buddhist temple anywhere in Thailand, those sema marking and marking stones will be outside of the boat, outside of the temple. Mm. And it's those Sema stones that mark this place as sacred, and then they build a temple there. But at Watsu and Mok, there's no temple. <laughs> it's just a sandy field in the middle. It's actually on the top of a hill that's been cut down, smoothed off, and it's got trees all around it. It's quite beautiful. Mm. And this is a place where uh, all of the monks gather. And it's got room for probably about 400 or so. Wow. Plus, a, plus an additional group for the uh, the lay people who can stand around. So it's a fairly big clearing at the top of this mountain. So this is what we're getting at about the materialism that is so de definitely stuck into the Thai culture. That same materialism is stuck in the minds of the Westerners. And that we can talk about that spiritual materialism in the sense of magical beliefs. The magical belief of eternalism, the magical belief of rebirth and reincarnation. And uh, uh, I, can, I can sit on the floor like everybody else and someday I'll get rewarded for all of that effort. When in fact, if you're not putting any effort in, you're not ever going to get any results. And a right. lot of people then are on Reddit talking about how they're not getting any value out of their practice when well, they're not practicing correctly. If they go right after the joy, they'll get some. Yeah. If they sit around putting their time in, waiting for the joy to come, uh, not going to happen. <laughs> Common <laughs> machines don't work like that. <laughs> yeah, you'll just get good at waiting and hoping. Yeah. Ah, and disappointing. Yeah. And not only that, but they also don't have the tools to deal with the monsters when they arise. Right. But with Anapanasati, that's the whole point, is getting the mind set so when those monsters arise, we can play whack-a-mole with them. 
exactly. rather than being overrun by them, which a lot of meditation students, they feel overrun or overwhelmed by all of this dukkha that comes out of their mind. And that's why they have an active life, because if they actually sit down and reflected about what things were and just enjoyed themselves, they wouldn't enjoy it long because the monsters would attack them. Yeah. The past. Yeah. All of the monsters come out of the past. Mm -hmm. But if we can learn to deal with the past successfully, how, how do we do it? With the joy that we're manufacturing. Ah, I call you too. Oh, yes, I should see that. I'm angry. Wow, I'm angry. Ha ah. <laughs> ha. Let me take a deep breath and not show my anger to anybody. Yeah. And so the, the question then is, how many angry words can you say before you come to that happy understanding? Oh, I'm angry. Can you keep it before it comes out? Even one word comes out, or does it have to be one or two? Yeah. Ah! And then you settle <laughs> down. Yeah. Or does it even have to be a full sentence? Mm -hmm. Or do you have to be halfway into the argument? <laughs> so the question is, the better your sati, then the quicker we can see these monsters. Mm. And if we quit and if we can catch them by the throat, just like we're catching the Dhamma by the throat, they can't bite us. Yeah. And so that's why we want to stay in that happy state, that state of satisfaction is because when in that state, when that stuff comes up, we're not going to allow it to pull us out of that happy state. Yeah. We're going to grab that feeling out and throwing. A <laughs> <laughs> it really is a snake. I've got it by the neck right now. <laughs> yeah. By the way, in that regard, there's a scene in a movie. And the movie, by the way, is named Cool Hand Luke. Mm -hmm. And Cool Hand Luke was, a, we don't know much about his background, but he was put in jail in Louisiana. And, and he was remarkable. He was so cool. <laughs> and, and in one of the scenes... Uh, they're out there, um, you know, cleaning the road and doing their work. And the guards are standing there with their rifles. And there's a rattlesnake. And people move back away from the rattlesnake. But Cool Hand Luke grabs that rattlesnake right above the, uh, the rattle. Uh -huh. So that the rattle is here and the rest of it is slinging in his hand and he's there running it around and i say i got it for you boss i got it for you take a good shot i'll hold it still take aim and then he holds it still and then snake, bang and the head comes off with the snake now that's cool <laughs> yeah that's cool but i don't recommend it to do that with the snake of buddhism because there's nobody there that's going to take aim and blow his head off for you after <laughs> you've got to grab that snake correctly by yourself. Right. So don't grab it by its magical end. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of the Buddhist snake is a magical snake. you got to grab it by the throat. Yeah. And that is the joy. To bring that joy up. That that's what you're wanting in your life. So... Do that for your meditation. Sit there and be happy. Be satisfied. That's the way to practice. And it's actually a fairly easy practice. There's a lot of things that we can do in the, in the, um, I have a group of tools that we can use. And those two group of tools are what I would call triggers or anchors or whatever like that, that will help us be mindful throughout the day to come back to this joyful state. But while you're sitting in meditation, that should be your goal in the sitting is how can you get yourself into a state of really nice satisfaction and not let any thoughts come in that's going to take you out of that state of satisfaction while you're breathing in and breathing out. And this is a training. Yeah. So you, you work the, with the breath and you work with watching the mind and you work with satisfaction and stay in that state of joy and you wind up, it's almost like playing the piano. Mm -hmm. One note does not a meditation object make. <laughs> if we're going to play music on our, with our lives, we've got to learn where all of those notes are. Yeah. All of the things. And so we incorporate them together. 
And that's part of the training is to be able to be in control of our breath. So we're constantly making sure that we've got enough air. Yeah. Because if we let it go back to normal, it will go take the brain back into survival mode. Hmm. That's what the reptilian's job is, is to keep them, keep us alive. So everything about the reptilian brain is survival mode. And yet we're not, there's, there's no survival issues. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, there's no survival issues, not at all. How much safer do we need to be? <laughs> yeah. So this is kind of an overview, but I did want to make sure that you understand that question about the, the four kinds of karma. And that all comma has to do with something that has a cause and effect or immediacy to it rather than long term. And with the understanding of comma, because you do know that the law and the rules of comma are so intricately bound to the beliefs in rebirth and reincarnation. But we can actually attack them from both ends. We can attack it from the recognition that no, there is no going to be any action that's going to store up and wait 300 years before it turns you into a donkey. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but what you do do has immediate benefits. If you practice Anapanasati and gain the skills, then that's good action is going to give you extraordinarily good results. But those extraordinarily good results that you have from those actions are going to put you out of action. <laughs> <laughs> So now that we understand this relationship and that this is the time, we've got to do it in this life. If we, and, and in fact, why wait five years? Yeah. Why wait five years? Yeah. You know, if you know that you can come out of your suffering now, let's do this now. Yeah. Let's right. not quit this practice. Let's keep going to this until we get the because <laughs> the results are good in the beginning. Let's make sure that they're good in the middle and they'll never for sure will wind up good in the end in the long run. Yeah, definitely. So do you have any questions about this conversation that we've had today? Um No, not not really. Um, uh, I will say that um, uh, I had a meditation yesterday where um, for, the, for the first time, uh, like, I actually did start to enter, like, this state that just felt very nice. And just, yeah, like, cool. Like, it wasn't... It wasn't, it wasn't like Jonic necessarily, but it was like, yeah, sitting here is nice. And okay, and, continue to develop that. Yeah, yeah. And it was very powerful because then it, it like, um, it got a lot easier to then come back from distractions because it was just much more apparent that the sitting and the not being distracted was a much better idea. <laughs> getting out of that and not feeling. Congratulations, you're on the path. The first step of the path as laid out in the Kasambian Sutra, number 48 in the Majjhima Nikaya, the first actual step on the path that is noble is when the student comes to understand that no matter how obstructed the mind gets, whether it's in intensity or uh, re frequency of return, no matter how obstructed the mind gets, the student can clean that stuff out and come back to this present moment and see the way things really are. Now that yeah. stage is a state that is noble, it is super mundane, it is a factor of the path, and it is an aspect that most people don't ever get. They don't ever get to the point of saying, I know that I can clean out my mind. Yeah. 
And so that's the first step along the path. And I think that you're about to say, I can do this. Perfect. Great. That's it. That's the end. I can do this stuff. And I'm getting the benefit out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Pat yourself on the back. Or, or whatever. <laughs> All right. Well, let's finish this call then. I think that you've got, you're on the path. Let's keep going. There's yeah. more to be done, but this is the place that you need to sit and rest yes. to keep that mind clean. Mm -hmm. And deeper stuff will start to come up. We'll talk about that late in, or later, whenever right. it, it does, and you can see it. When the Duca comes, we'll talk about it. <laughs> Until then, let's work on more and more sukha. Yes. More and more pleasure, more and more joy, more and more satisfaction, more and more the attitude of a lion that I can do this, that I am a winner, yeah. that I can clean out my mind. Mm -hmm. I am not a victim to my own past any longer. Yeah. Or the karma machine for that matter. Or the karma machine. Yeah. Great. Right. That sounds like uh, something I want to do. Excellent. Enjoy. I will. Okay. All right, Max. Well, we'll see you next time. Maybe in about a week or so. Yes. All right. Excellent. Great talking with you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.